What is going on guys? Welcome back to another Code Wars video on this channel. It's been a while since I recorded a video of this kind. And for those of you who don't know what this is about, it's essentially me just solving uh, coding challenges on Code Wars and showing you the full unfiltered process. So I'm going to include all the mistakes. I'm going to include all the uncertainties and all the failed attempts. And I'm going to show you exactly how I come to a solution if I come to one. And a lot of you guys enjoy watching these kinds of videos. So let us get right into it. All right, so here we are in Code Wars. Now, for those of you who don't know the platform, it's essentially a platform for coding challenges. You can click here on practice in the sidebar, and here you have a bunch of challenges with eight difficulty levels. We can click here on the drop down. It goes from 8Q being the easiest up until 1Q being the hardest. And uh, then you can also see that multiple languages are supported for most challenges. And the rules for this video are quite simple. I'm not allowed to use AI assistance like ChatGPT. I'm not allowed to communicate to other people or with other people. Uh, I am allowed to use Google and Stack Overflow, but not to find a full solution to a problem, but to just Google specific things like how to sort a list in a certain way, how to merge data frames, how to use a certain function. I'm allowed to look up these small things. I'm not allowed to look up the full solution, obviously, because that would take away the challenge and uh, the fun. Also, I'm allowed to have an occasional uh, occasional sip of performance enhancing coffee or water, alternatively. I also have this here. Uh, so don't be irritated by that. But since I'm not cutting this and probably this is going to be a one hour video, uh, I got to stay hydrated and enhanced. Um, you can follow along with the video. You can try to solve the same challenges or you can just watch whatever you like. Um, obviously, I didn't prepare anything for this video, so I don't have any challenges that I already looked into. I'm going to look for a challenge now, and I think we're going to start with uh, my level is 5Q. Uh, I think I'm going to start with a 6Q, which should be easy enough to uh, warm up. And of course, I need to pay attention to not pick something that I have already solved. Is this something that I've already solved? I'm not sure. Um, last, uh, let's see last digit symmetry, maybe I should disable full screen here. Uh, what do we have here? Consider the number 1176 and it's square 1176 times itself is that notice that the first two digits form a prime, the first two digits of the square also form a prime. The last two digits and the last two digits here are the same. Given two numbers representing a range A, B, how many numbers satisfy this property within a range? Okay, this seems kind of simple. So let's go with this one. I think it's a good one to warm up. So we're going to just go for train. Um, so if I understood this correctly, what we want is we want the first two digits to, to be a prime if they're a prime in the base number. So if, if essentially a number has its first two digits forming a prime, then the number squared, the result of that, the first two digits should, should also form a prime. And if the last two digits, or not if the last, the last two digits should be the same. So basically, let's maybe not use solve directly, but the check would be something like, um, we need to have a helper function is prime, or maybe we don't need to have that, but uh, maybe we want to have a helper a function is prime. There we want to check if a number is prime. We're going to take the first two digits. We're going to turn them into an integer. We're going to check if that is prime. We're going to square the number. We're going to check if the first two digits of that result um, also form a prime. If that is satisfied, we're going to also see, or maybe we should check first for the last two digits because the prime calculation uh, might be a bit or actually we can do that even without iteration because we can I think this is more efficient if we're always going to look at the first two digits if that is the task we can just hard code this because that's going to be more efficient we don't have to iterate uh, and try to do any um, any calculations we can actually just use a dictionary so I can say prime dictionary uh, or actually prime list is even simpler so let's go with or just call it primes. And we only need to include all the primes between um, actually even only between 10 and 20 because uh, 10 and 99, sorry, because we don't even have to check for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I can just include all the primes uh, 
um, between 10 and 99. And maybe I can do that locally with Python. So maybe I can just do this here and get all the prime numbers. I'm going to use Linux for this. So I'm going to navigate to the desktop. Come on, desktop. Uh, and I'm going to create a new file, which I'm going to call primefinder.py. And here I'm just going to say uh, def find primes. Yeah, like this. And essentially, maybe I'm going to do it like this. I'm going to say is prime n. And I'm going to say for for number in range zero up until n half plus one. Because of course, I only have to check up until n halves and maybe plus one if it's uh, if it's rounded down. So actually floor division probably. Uh, so for number in all numbers that could be actually I should not include one. So I should include two, but not one. Um, actually, I think I need to add plus two because the floor division might result if I have a number uh, 17, what would that be? Uh, 17 divided by two floor division would be 16 divided by two. So eight. Yeah, I mean, that should be enough. So we can do it like that. So for number in range two and floor division two plus one, we're going to to check. So we're going to say prime equals false, or actually prime equals true. And if we find something and can divide uh, divide it, so if n modulo number equals zero, prime, or actually, we don't need even that we, we can just say return, re return false, and otherwise, return true, like this. And then we can just say, find primes for n in range. And we need to find all from 10 up until 99. Uh, or actually, we're going to do a list comprehension, we don't even need a function, we're going to just say print uh, n if or actually n for n in range 10 100 if is prime n. That should give us all the prime numbers. Python three prime finder. There you go. Those are all the prime numbers, we can copy them. We can use them here as a list. And then essentially, we can uh, check. What was that? Oh, actually, I can I can enable vim bindings here. This is very nice. So let me just zoom into this a little bit. So you guys can see that. Um, so that is the list. What was again the question I think we need to check in a certain range. So given two numbers representing a range, how many numbers satisfy the property within that range. So the last one is not included. The first one is and then we just need to check the two first if they are prime in the number itself and in the square. And the last two have to be the same. So I can just say here, for for um, number in range a b, if and then we can, uh, should we do that? I'm going to do it with the string now. And maybe we can find a more efficient solution. If I say string number, and the last two, um, or actually, how do we do that? Like this, right? The last two digits, is that correct? I'm not sure if that works. Let me just see. Um, Python three, if I have some string, whatever, if I say negative two up until the end, it should give me nine one, right? Yeah, okay. So if that is the same as taking that number squared, and taking the last two digits up until the end, or the last two digits, then we check if the number if the first two numbers are prime, or form a prime for the number itself and for the square. So we're going to say, um, if int, 
string number uh, in primes. Uh, or actually, we could make those strings, but let's do it like that. And int string number squared. Then we have a true. And what do we need to return here? Solve to 1200. Okay, the amount of numbers. So essentially, I can say count equals zero, count plus equals one, then we return count, that should work, right? No, okay. Uh, testing solve nine should equal one, when do I get something that I shouldn't get? Let me read the instructions again. Consider the number, there you go, the first two digits of that form a prime the first two digits of the square form a prime so let me maybe just get this here run this locally and see what it does so uh, not this all right can i copy this no okay doesn't seem like i can copy this maybe if i disable the vim mode let me try again, copy, there you go. So if I run this, print solve a, or actually what was it, two, 1,000 or 12,000, something like this. What do I get here? I get 129, what was the input? No, it was 1,200. So let's remove a zero. Again, okay, we get nine. I would like to know why. So every time we get in here, I want to know what the number is and what the number squared is. Probably I make some very stupid mistake. So that's the number. Uh, okay, that's not a prime. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah, of course, if I don't check if that's part of primes, of course, it's not going to work. So that's the code, I think this should work. Test. Okay, it works. So the question is now, can we do this more efficiently? I'm, I'm sure we can. So how can we get maybe the first two digits without using string? Um, I think this is something that we can do with a logarithm, right? So if I have Python three, uh, if I have a number Let's say this one here, if I take and I think for this, we're going to need the math module, import math, math lock of some number. Now, what's the base of this? I don't know what the base is. If I say base 10. No, actually, the other way around. No, how does the lock function of Python work? Math log Python. Uh, maybe from the docs, please. X and base. So, okay. I'm not sure if this is what I want to do. Can I just use log 10 math log 10 of some number? Okay, this is not what I wanted to do. I mean, how did it work? I think there's a method to do that. This is something I'm allowed to Google get first two digits from integer Python. Okay, now this is the obvious uh, thing. This is also the obvious thing. Can I do this without using string? So this is what I already did. Oh, this is it, I think. What does it do? It takes the logarithm of the number base 10, it, it subtracts one, and then it takes 10 to the power of that. And number is divided by that. I think that would work. But I think since I don't want to spend the time now understanding what this does exactly. Uh, I'm just gonna 
I'm just going to keep the string method one, two, three, two, one, three, one. Okay, that seems to work. Uh, I don't want to use that because I don't want to spend the time now to understand this. But this also works. So just uh, as a quick recap here, what we do is we have a static list of primes. The reason we have that is because uh, this is then a con constant runtime complexity, we don't need to uh, use a function to all every time iterate through all these values. And since we only have the primes between 10 and 99, uh, it's reasonable to just use the memory instead of always checking. Um, and then what we do is essentially we go through all the numbers, if a number has the same two starting digits as its square number, uh, we're just taking that. Um, maybe it would be even more efficient to do this first because because of this end, I think that if the first two digits are actually not that it would terminate and I think this is the case more often. So maybe let's just maybe let me enable vim bindings here again. Maybe let's just swap this here. It's going to be the same functionality, but I think it's just more efficient. I don't know if that's even something that we can see here completed in 1706 milliseconds. Let's just let's just run this one more time to see if that's okay, one six, and maybe a third time one seven. Now let's see what happens if I swap this. Oh, this is actually faster. Okay. Because it's a simple Yeah, okay, this is faster. Let's go with this one. So attempt and does it work? Is it crashing my browser? There you go. Works. Submit. Now let's see the best practice solutions are always very impressive. Um, okay, yeah, this is something that I could have done as well. I thought about this, I actually mentioned this. But okay, everyone is basically doing it like that. Okay, this guy is doing something else. What the hell is this? What the hell is this? Okay, those are three different solutions. But this is Oh, my God, this is way too much code for this task. Is there someone who has like a Oh, this? What is that? Okay, that's basically I think the same thing. Or is it? Those are the primes. I mean, he includes primes that are not relevant. Okay, yeah. Looks like we have a pretty decent solution. So let's go ahead and do another one. Let's go to practice again. Uh, I would like to do another six Q one and then we can go for a uh, then we can go for a five Q one. So coins, what is coins? A random place has a currency system that consists of two coins who are given the value of the coins, they can be identical, and they will always be positive, find the largest value that any whole number combination of the two cannot produce. What does that mean? Find the largest value that any whole number combination of the two cannot produce. Oh, okay, wait, okay. I'm not sure if that is. Do I not need to prove this in some mathematical way to be certain? I mean, we can try that. I'm not sure if I want to spend too much time on this. But if we have two coin values, I mean, I don't I want to brute force it, of course, I could just, you know, combine all of them and then see what happens. But I think there's some math behind this that we can just think about. If I say, I mean, let's say, for example, I have five and 12, for example, as coins. The, the question is, what is the largest value that any whole number combination of the two cannot produce? I mean, for the case of five and 12, any combination, okay, so this is difficult, actually. Or, or maybe I'm thinking in a stupid way. But if I have 12 and five, that would be 17. If I have, I mean, if I now say, okay, I cannot produce 16, would that be correct? I mean, I could do five plus five plus five, 
I don't think that I can produce 16 with that. But then again, I have other numbers that are larger than 16 that I couldn't produce, probably. So for example, maybe if I have something like 12 plus 12, that's 24. Um, can I produce 25 in some way? So 25, uh, 12 plus 5 plus 5. I mean, I can't produce, of course, 25. I just use five fives. But can I produce... I mean, actually, isn't this quite simple? I mean, I can produce every number that is divisible by 5, any number that's divisible by 12, any number that's divisible by 17. Uh, but what's the largest number? I, I'm not even sure if there are not infinitely many numbers that I could look at. I mean, is there a point, is there a certain... Uh, point from which on I could produce any number. Is that something that can exist? I mean, I'm not sure about that. Let me maybe read this thing again. Given the values of the coins, it can be identical, they will always be positive. I mean, for example, if I have the values 2 and 2, I could never produce an odd number, right? Or am I stupid? I mean, I could never produce three, but I could also never produce seven. I could also never produce 19. I could only produce even numbers. This is actually true for for all combination of even numbers. If I have two even numbers, I mean, maybe this is the first check. If coin, coin one modulo two equals zero and coin two, coin two modulo two equals zero, then I have to return negative one because then there is no largest number because any number that's odd will not be a result of those two coins, no matter what I do. Um, oh, okay, this is what it says. If it is an infinite number, then we can also return negative one. Okay, this explains a lot. Um, let's say it's not an infinite number. When would that be the case? If it's not an infinite number, Two and three, one's the largest number. Two and two, we have negative one. Okay. We'll never. Okay, this is actually what it says here. Maybe I should read. <laughs> I should read the explanation more. Um. Let's think about this. If I say, I think we need to do something with modulo here. Um. Can I do something? I mean, actually, can I? If I have one coin, maybe I can do the same thing as with the two. If I have three and three, I can only ever produce three, six, nine, twelve, and so on, and never something. I mean, actually, if they're the same, can I even have an answer to this? I think if they're the same, this doesn't work. So maybe I can also make us a check here if coin one equals coin two, then also return negative one, because then I always have some uh, modulo class. Is this what it's called? I mean, modulo class math, I know the German term. Um, let me just Google what the German uh, term is in English. Residue class, I'm not sure if that's true. Can I just go to Wiki Wikipedia and then go to English or something? There you go. Is there something like, ah, oh, congruence classes. Re residue classes, yeah, this is what I'm talking about. Because you have certain classes, um, for example, three, six, nine, and so on are zero modulo three, this is a class. Um, and then you have other values, like, for example, four, seven, uh, 10, those are one modulo three. Um, so maybe we have to do something with that. This is a little bit, I don't know if I'm overlooking something extremely simple here, but this seems to be a lit, uh, a, a bit more challenging um, than the last one. 
So if I have, first of all, if I have one, I can produce any number. So maybe if coin one equals one or coin two equals one, I will always have to return negative one. That's for sure. Because if I have a one, I can produce any number. So there's no number I cannot produce. Thus, I can return negative one. Um, and that's, I think, the only case, the only number for which this is the case. So how do I basically I have to cover all of these classes here, all of these residue classes or whatever they're called? Um, because if there's one class that it's not that is not covered, um, that's a problem. So how would I do that? The problem is I don't know up until which point I have to check because of course this goes into infinity. So I think there's a basic rule that if I apply it on the small numbers, it should also apply in general as a pattern when we go towards larger numbers. So let's go with examples. I think examples are useful. If I have four and five, what would that mean? I cannot produce one, two, three, of course, I could produce four, I could produce five, can I produce six? No, I cannot produce six. I cannot produce seven, I cannot produce eight. So here again, I think it would be a pattern that goes on to infinity, because in this case, I can produce all numbers that are zero modulo four, and all numbers that are zero modulo five, and also, um, what is actually the, the question? Number combination. But number combination doesn't mean addition, right? So I cannot, I'm not allowed to add them, or am I? Of course I am. I mean, I'm allowed to add four and five. So I would also have everything that's zero modulo nine. Yeah. I think so. Um, okay, so I have that. Can I add something else? I mean, if I have plus four, is that something new now? Or am I just, I mean, that would be now zero modulo 13, right? And then maybe if I say plus four again, can we see a pattern here? That would be zero modulo 17. So those are primes. I mean, not all of them, of course, but this is now prime. And if I add five, I have again another number. So I have all the things covered where I have zero modulo, uh, in this case, 22. So the question is, I think as long as I have something that's not covered, um, it will go into infinity, because if I have any class that's not covered, for example, um, if I have the class zero modulo seven, not covered, then if I'm not mistaken, that means that I there are infinitely many values, or am I mistaken? I'm not sure because then I would also not have uh, modulo 14. I would also not have zero modulo 21. And then it would go, I think I'm not sure there would probably we would probably need to have a proof for this, but wouldn't this go up until infinity? The, que the question is now if I was to approach this with a brute force algorithm, so if I was just going to try all the combinations and then come to a conclusion, where would I stop? When do I know that there are infinitely many numbers? Because if I have four and five, for example, of course, three is a number I cannot produce. But seven is also a number that I cannot produce. Um, maybe if I have the number 10, does that mean that if I have a number that's larger than than the sum, that I cannot produce, would that maybe be an indication that it would go on forever? I'm not sure. Let's just, let's just give it a brute force try here. Let's just say, um, if, or maybe no, um, how do I formulate this is this is a tricky one. Maybe I'm completely stupid, but actually, it's listed as mathematics. So this is actually something that requires math. Uh, 
maybe I can just Google some of the theory here. So uh, how to check which residue classes are covered by two integers. Proving by, I don't think that that is what I'm looking for. But maybe there's a math rule that I just forgot or don't know. I mean, what we what we need to, to do is essentially, if, if I can find a whole class that is not covered by any combination of those two values, then it goes on to infinity. That's for sure. Because if I have some complete class, uh, zero modulo x, and all the numbers that are in that class are not covered by by coin one and coin two in any combination, then there are infinitely many values that I cannot cover. And then I would have to return negative one. And the question is, how do I check for that? And the second question is, if that is not the case, how do I find find out that this is not the case? And how do I find the maximum number then? I would like to have more examples. Because I think that in most cases, there will be an infinite number that we cannot produce. But I don't know how to prove that or how to show that or if that's even true. So if I have two and eight, uh, let me just see how long am I already recording? I'm going to give it a try for five more minutes. And if it doesn't, if I don't have an idea, I'm going to admit defeat and I'm going to look at the solution. But I think it has something to do with this number theory thing. So which residue classes are covered by two integers? Because that's essentially the question here. Or maybe let me think about this differently. If I have Let's use examples again. If I have something simple, like what's the example here? Two, three is just one. Let's go with three and four. If I have three and four, of course I cannot do one, two, and I can't do five, and I can't do six, but I can do seven. Oh, I can do six because I can just use two times three. So that's also everything that's zero modulo three will be included. Zero modulo four is included. Zero modulo seven is included. And then everything that's a combination of the things themselves. So three, 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 it's going to be zero modulo nine, zero modulo six, but that's already zero modulo three. So that's fine. Same for four, but the combinations of the two. So I have two times three, or let's say x times three, plus x or plus y times four. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's again, just something that's modulo, is it modulo seven? I'm not sure. Because if I now go and add another four, I have eight and three, 11. And that's a new thing. Isn't it? So if I divide by 11, and something is zero, doesn't mean that it has to be zero in any of those, right? It's difficult. I admit that I have no idea how to approach this on a math basis, I think I know how to implement it in code once I have the solution. But is there something like a hint or anything discuss? Okay. I mean, people are saying they don't know what the Oh, nice, my code is gone. Um, people say they don't know what the question is. I know what the question is. But I don't know what the rule is. Because the question is, which values can you cover? Are there infinitely many values that you cannot cover? This definitely has to do something with a modulo and with these classes re residue classes. But I don't know exactly what the rule is. So I'm going to just um, skip or I'm going to unlock the solutions. And I want to see what the rule is and if I can understand it. 
This is a very simple one. Okay. If the greatest common denominator is not one, that means, okay, so if the greatest common denominator is one, it's negative one, because we can cover everything or what. Else, coin minus one times, what the fuck is that? I'm not sure I understand this. Let me just open the terminal here for an example. So if I have import math, if I have three and four, math GCD three, four, that's one. Greatest common. Okay, because they don't share any other denominator. So if I have something like math dot GCD four and eight, that would be four. In this case, what would be the solution? In this case would be three times seven minus one, 20. The largest number that those can't cover. Why? I don't understand why exactly. Okay, this is a little bit more complicated. Okay, they're doing it with the greatest common denominator. So if the greatest common denominator is one, it means that no number, so one coin number is not divisible by the other coin number. Or no, that they have no common denominator that's greater than one. Okay. I'm not sure I understand why this works. Maybe I'm just stupid because I'm recording. But I don't know if you guys understand, let me know in the comment section, I probably can also look at this after the video. I'm not exactly sure why this especially I mean, I understand to some degree why this is the case. I don't understand why this calculation gives you the number. I mean, yeah, okay. Not sure. Alright, so we're going to try a 5q one now, I think this should actually be easier than the 6q one because this was, in my opinion, harder than the usual 6q challenges. So let's go to difficulty 5q. And let's see if we can find something that looks somewhat interesting. What is rot 13? How can you tell an extrovert from an introvert at NSA? Uh -huh. I found this joke on Usenet, but the punchline is scrambled, maybe you can decipher it. According to Wikipedia, Rot 13 is frequently used to obfuscate jokes on Usenet. For this task, you only supposed to substitute characters, not spaces, punctuation numbers. I mean, Rot 13 just means that we're rotating the ASCII characters, right? I mean, that should be extremely simple. I mean, actually, we can do that as, as Wikipedia says with a lookup table, I think that should be super, super easy. So I can basically just take this here as a string. Uh, I want to use vim bindings here again, I can just take this here as a string uh, in string. And I can take this one as an output string. And then I can take the message and I think there's a Python translate function. Um, and you basically just pass it a dictionary. So I think we can create such a dictionary easily by saying translate dictionary is going to be key value for k. Or actually, we're going to say in string, I is going to point to out string, I for I in range, length in string. And then we can just return. How do we use the function again? Message dot translate, translate dictionary. Isn't that basically all we have to do here? Uh, not exactly. Probably. Be 
because yeah, I think that the problem is I'm not exactly sure. But what's the problem actually? Mm. Let me just see what happens here locally. So if I open up again a Python script, translator.py, and if I say this is the code and I want to rotate the following message, what did we have here? This. What do I actually get as an output? Okay, it doesn't do anything. Am I even using the function correctly? Or what is the dictionary? Maybe, maybe I should print the dictionary. The dictionary seems fine, actually. does it mm. seems like it should work so what's the problem we're getting the exact same message I think we can also try without that function um, we can also try to just say uh, for in character in in string. This would be a iterative solution here. For character in the in string, message equals message dot replace. Or actually, I should probably say for i in range length in string message replace in string i with out string i i mean that should have the effect that we want to have so i can just comment this out you can also just return the message shouldn't that oh doesn't work but it's it did transform this, it just didn't transform this. Why is that? Is the table not correct? I mean, what should happen? E should be replaced by R, but it isn't. So what are we actually doing here? In string I replaced by out string I. Oh, I mean, actually, why doesn't it work then? Because I think what should happen is we have a capital E should be replaced by R, but it isn't replaced by R. It's still E. So if I just take this string here, if I take the message, And if I replace it, so if I replace E with R, then it should be replaced, right? Okay, but it doesn't happen in the function. I don't know why. Probably I'm, again, not seeing something quite obvious. So in the message, we want to replace all E's by R's. Oh, of course, it doesn't work because, okay, of course, it doesn't work because we're replacing E by R and then we're replacing it again, R by E. That's a problem. So, okay, probably we should use the translate method then. But how does it work? Is there a Python documentation of this function? Translating. 
This is not what I'm talking about. Translate string. Why is there no Python docs? Build in types. Translate using string. This static, a static method returns a translation table. Make trans. Okay, so Python make trans. I think we probably need to take the dictionary and we need to turn it into such a table. So I have to basically have this dictionary. Can you show an example dictionary? There you go. Uh, what does this do? Hello, Sam, string, make trends. Okay, so basically, I have to just take this, take this dictionary that I have here. And I basically say, table equals str make trans translation dictionary, does it work like that? This late dictionary. And then I don't need a loop or anything, I can just return this. Does it work like that? There you go, works. So I think that if I now submit this particular solution, we should have solved the challenge. There you go. Nice. Submit. Let's see what the best practice is. Okay, so he's working with the ORT function. So basically with the ASCII code, which is also fine. But I think this is just the easiest solution. If you can map it, you don't have to do any calculations, you just map it. Um, and you can use translate and make trans. He imports string, you don't need to do that. You can also just use str. But yeah, we solved this one. Nice. So let's finally maybe go for another 5Q and then we can end this video. Uh, let's look at something that's definitely not mathematical. I don't want to do some formulas again here. Uh, mathematics, no. Formula one race, mathematics, mathematics. Greed is good. Greed is a dice game played with five, six sided dice. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to score a throw according to these rules. You will always be given an array with five six-sided value, six-sided dice values. So three ones is is a thousand points. Whatever. What's what's the what's the task here? Oh, looks too complicated to read, not to implement. Um, count the domain names. Also looks like a too, too long of a description. Fibonacci streaming. By the power set of Castle Grayskull. Oh, this looks, it's again mathematics. Write a function that returns all of the sublists of a list array. So basically from one, two, three, we get an empty set, one, two, one, two, three, one, three, two, three, one, two, three. I'm not sure if I want to accept this because it's again mathematical and I don't want to spend 30 minutes again trying to figure this out. Uh, let me think about this if I would know how to approach it. I mean, you go through the individuals. Basically, isn't this just, can you not just use a Python combinations module? So for example, combinations py wouldn't it just be if i have the input one two three four five for example wouldn't it just be um okay sorry for the cut guys i had to answer the phone uh where was i i wanted to import iter tools and i wanted to say give me all the combinations so if i have all the combinations iter tools 
um, what is the function? Iter tools combine or something. Combinations. Yeah, so combinations basically of the base list. Let's call this L. If I say give me all the combinations of size one and two and three and four and so on. Wouldn't that be enough? So, okay, I need to make this a list. Yeah, and I, I now do this essentially for, or does it have to be? So one, two, three, the order is not important. So essentially I can just go and say, um, one and four, yeah, one and four is the same as four and one, so it's not listed, that's good. So let's do this challenge, I think it should be quite easy. So if I go and say, Again, Vim bindings are not active. If I say here, import iter tools, then I have the power set, power set is gonna be a list and it's going to contain an empty list. And then I'm gonna say, uh, yeah, then I'm gonna say four, something that we don't need in range length a combinations or actually we're going to need that we're going to need the i we're going to start at one combinations or actually iter tools dot combinations of the array with that i power set plus and then x4 x in. Oh, actually, I didn't want to submit yet. Or I didn't want to attempt yet. Return power set. Shouldn't that be enough? Oh, plus equals not plus. What's the problem here? It Okay, it's actually no, it's not the same. Okay, plus one. Okay, that was quite simple. I think this should Okay. Nice. This was easy. Way easier than the two coins. There you go. What's the best solution? Not using iter tools. What does it do? Set num set plus equals x for x and set oh this is nice this is nice so basically just taking what we already have in the set and adding that to the number or adding the number to it Makes sense. But wouldn't you get in this case, I'm not sure if I'm stupid now, but wouldn't you get in this case also, um, combinations 2PY, wouldn't you get in this case also 1-1 one, one and stuff like that? Or am I mistaken? So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Python 3, combinations 2PY. No, it does not include 1, 1. Why does it not include 1, 1? So X in set. Set is an empty set. Now, for each number in S, I include into this set. So I would have, I start with this. And for each number, I take what all, what is already there. And I add this number to it. So it would be 1. And it would be 2. Then it would be three and so on. Three, uh, four, 
and five. I mispressed five times in a row now. So then what it does is it goes through all of those again and it adds. Oh, actually, does that? No, what does it do here? Four number and S. So for one, it creates. Oh, no, this is intelligent because it starts, it does add only one. And then what it does is it adds two. And then it adds two to one. So it does one, two. And then it goes for three and it adds, oh, this is brilliant. So then you have one, three. And you have two, three. Okay, I understand what it's doing. Nice solution. Nice solution. Probably more efficient than what I submitted. This guy's also doing it with iter tools, so this also works. So that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and hope you learned something. Let me know in the comment section down below if you like this kind of video, if I should make more of those coding challenges on Code Wars or on other platforms. And as always, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell to not miss a single future video for free. Other than that, thank you much for watching. See you in the next video and bye.